Um, we have a great panel tonight. Tara Duggan from San Francisco Chronicle is here moderating. She loves cheese, um, and she's written about it. Uh, we have wonderful cheesemakers Anna Hancock from Pug's Leap next to Tara, Jill Giacomini Bosch from Point Reyes Farmstead Cheese on the end, and Vivian Strauss, whose parents uh, created, founded Strauss Family Creamery, and Vivian uh, is the brains behind the Sonoma Marin Cheese Trail map and app. Uh, so I'll let you. T <laughs> yes, I'll let you tell them a bit more about themselves. That, uh, so let's just welcome them. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. And we're going to make you work a little for your cheese. But don't worry. No one gets to go out early and eat cheese. You have to. It's all going to happen at the same time. Um, and I'll give everyone a brief introduction. Uh, I just wanted to quickly talk about the subject we're, we're, we're going to be discussing tonight. Um, I didn't realize that over 100 different cheeses are made in the Marin-Sonoma cheese country which is so close to us. It's 22,000 acres of dairy farms. And I did a recent article about the region and didn't realize that it's been supplying dairy products to the Bay Area since the gold rush. So there's this real deep history there. Um, some of you may know that Marin French cheese just had its 150th anniversary, which is pretty amazing for this area. Not a lot was going on then. And then another big anniversary was Strauss Family Creamery had its 20th anniversary last year. And that was, I think that's one of the companies that's been very influential in this whole dairy, the dairy revival that's been going on for several decades in the area. Um, it was all, it's <clears throat> a big part of the artisanal farming movement in the area as well, as you all probably know. A couple other interesting dates from recent cheese history are uh, in 1979 was when Laura Chanel goat cheese started, and then 1997 was when Cowgirl Creamery launched with, um, that Peggy Smith and Sue Conley started out as cheesemakers, and now they're a very important part of the distribution of cheese from all the small cheesemakers that are getting their start. So uh, I just want to introduce our guests a little bit more. Um, Jill Giacomini Bosch, you're one of the co-founders of Point Reyes Farmstead Cheese Company, which sh she and her three sisters um, founded with your fa with your father Bob, right? Who is a dairyman who's been in the area for about 50 years. Is that right? Um, and Point, you probably know the original Blue. It's probably the most famous cheese in their lineup. And they continue to win awards. They founded the company in 2000, and they continue to get big awards. Last year, they got a Good Food Award and a American Cheese Society Award. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and you're also on the board of several dairy organizations, right? Like uh, the American Cheese Society. Is that right? OK. And then Vivian Strauss. Um, is, as you know, part of the Strauss family. And she worked for her, you worked for your brother's company for a while, right? And 11 years. 11 years, 11 years. yeah. <laughs> and also you worked for Cowgirl Creamer. But before that, you went off to be an actress, That's right? That's right. And <laughs> but the draw, I mean, you say you're uh, someone who has an obsession with cows. You just couldn't, couldn't leave them behind. <laughs> it's terrible, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll hear more about that. And then we have Anna, who's a little bit newer in the in the cheese world. Although you start, uh, it was 2008 that you started. So you, Anna has two different. She has White Whale Farm, which is the farm, and then Pug's Leap is the cheese company, which you purchased from some other from other cheesemakers, correct? And they taught you how to make cheese. So, um, but the interesting thing about Anna is she started her farm when she was a law student. So she, I think she's an overachiever. <laughs> and she managed to pass the bar while she was making cheese. So <laughs> it's impressive. <laughs> so I wanted, one thing that's interesting is Vivian and Jill, you both left the dairy world for a while, right? And then you came back after working in other fields. Jill, can you talk about that, uh, what it was like, and what, what made you want to come back to working with your family's um, you sure. know, company? Um, well, I'm a clear example. I tell my kids all the time, never say never. Um, <laughs> never in my wildest dreams did I think I would come back to the family farm. Um, my sisters and I were raised there. I should um, just give a little background. My mom and dad bought the farm in 1959. 
My dad was actually raised in the region about three miles south of where our dairy sits um, on his family's dairy farm, his dad's dairy. Um, you know, was raised in it, had a love of it as a, as a young child, went off to UC Davis, got his ag science degree, came back to the community with my mom at his side, and together they bought our farm. And we sit about uh, three miles north of the town of Point Reyes, about three miles south of Marshall, right on Highway 1 alongside Tamales Bay truly the home of the happy California cows. Mm -hmm. um, a little plug there. <laughs> and uh, my sisters and I were raised on the farm um, to my father's dismay, despite his many attempts. He had four daughters, no sons. Mm -hmm. And for a, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, third generation farmer himself, that was a little bit difficult pill to swallow. And uh, especially because my mom, being a farmer's daughter herself from the Sacramento Delta, she had, was she experienced um, kind of the pressure that her brother, my uncle, um, had placed on him growing up that, you know, taking over their family farm was his right or his, you know, it was his destiny. He could go away to college, but he was coming back to the family farm to take it over. And so she didn't want to see that happen to her kids. So she, she kind of, you know, pushed us away as young kids. We were not involved in the farm at all. We were not your typical 4-H FFA kids taking cows to the fair, um, you know, uh, having a lot of farm chores. I mean, if rather, you know, my mom was taking us all over to travel and explore other areas of education. And when we were of age, she said, go, you know, get away from the farm. If and when you're ever ready to come back, you'll decide that on your own. And I think it was all part of a master plan. I think she was <laughs> scheming from when we were young kids um, because when it was really time to decide what the next evolution of the farm was going to look like when my parents were uh, approaching retirement age, um, and we suddenly were thinking, wow, you know, if they retire, that means we have to, the, you know, we're not gonna have the farm anymore, they're gonna sell it. You know, we, we, wait, no, we have to come back. We have to somehow make um, a life for ourselves here. And because there were four of us, you know, we thought we can't just continue selling fluid milk. We have to do something um, that is sustainable for ourselves, but something that, um, you know, that would bring a value-added product, um, not just to Bay Area consumers, but something that we could grow and develop on a national scale. And uh, cheese is, was the answer, thanks to folks like the cowgirls that were uh, had only been in business for three years prior to us, Laura Chanel, Marin French. We saw that there was this burgeoning, you know, artisan cheese movement, um, really kind of gaining a lot of, of strength and foothold across the country. And um, being from Northern California, you know, right here with the wine country and these other cheese makers that were just a couple years um, more established than um, we would be, we thought this is the time to jump in, and uh, we did. Great. And how about you, Vivian? What was, how did that work for you? I hated growing up on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I felt so alone, I have to say. You know, I felt very different. My parents were immigrants. Um, and I always, I don't know if I dare say this, but we were sort of liberal. And my father was from Germany. My mother was Dutch, fled Hitler. And the whole community was fairly um, uh, on the right. And so I, <laughs> we, there was everything different about us. And I, was very lonely, and I just thought, oh my God, I want to go. My best friend was my cow, so <laughs> that's why it sort of stuck with me. And I and I I ran and went off to be an actress. And I I was saying to somebody, the first time I came back from college, and I was driving home, I went, oh my God, it's beautiful here. And I, I just I don't think I'd ever seen it before. And um, I did go off to be an actress. I lived in San Francisco, then New York, and then L.A. And it was when my brother decided to transition our dairy. And I was always coming home, obviously, very close family. And, uh, and he transitioned the dairy to organic and opened Strauss Family Creamery. And he needed help, and I had no job. <laughs> and I said, OK. So I did sales and marketing from LA. I telecommuted and uh, would drive back and forth once in a while and lie to people about how the cows were doing. I'd say, oh, it's really foggy, you know? Because <laughs> it's always foggy in Marshall. So um, it was. Um, and then I just realized I loved it, and I came back. So I ended up coming back. And when, did, when was that that you came back? I came back in 2008. So it was actually after I left working for the creamer. I, left work, I 
worked for 11 years doing sales and marketing, built the company, and left after my parents died. It was a little complicated. I was sort of in charge of things, and so I just couldn't do it all. So I left in 2005, and in 2008, I moved back. And Anna, you're, you're sort of the opposite. You grew up here in San Francisco, right? And then tell us about what made you want to be on the farm and to change, change your lifestyle yeah. like that. Um, well, I grew up uh, literally on 30th in California, um, very close by, and had too many animals. We had dogs, cats, snakes, rats, tortoises, everything. And I wanted to be a vet or a lawyer, which didn't make any sense. And I ended up, my high school, I went to Urban. They had a program at the end of the, uh, end of the senior year, which California studies. And so for the last two months, we traveled to farms, conventional, organic, and I think that sort of planted a seed. And I went to farm camp for years. Um, and I was when I wanted to be a vet, I wanted to be a large animal vet, which people thought was crazy because you're from the city. And so everything sort of ended up that I ended up going to law school, and which I thought that I wanted. And a year in, my family and I um, were found this farm was for sale as a goat dairy and. You know, we thought, well, this is crazy. And the day we were supposed to go see it, I said, you know, I don't, I don't even think we should go. And my mom said, you know what? You always learn something. Let's just go and, you know, check it out. And we all fell in love with it and um, thought the dairy, goat dairy industry maybe was more of a financially stable industry to get into than it was. Um, <laughs> and so there have been many. This was six years ago. This was 2008. And I still had two years of law school. So I went back and forth milking on the weekends and leading two strange lives. I went to Hastings, and, and it was a very odd time. And um, finally, I was back on the farm. And, um, and it's exactly what I remember in the middle of law school, I went to the you know, guidance um, counselor or the person to help you find jobs. And, and I just spent a day um, vaccinating goat kids. <laughs> like 120 goat kids, and I was sore and bruised, and I was walking out of her office, and I said, you know, I think I would rather do this any day than do, like, paperwork in an office. And I just sort of, hmm, oh, <laughs> you know, okay, I think that this is where I'm supposed to be. And so we knew from the beginning we would have to do cheese to sustain the dairy because we wanted to stay a small dairy. So we only were milking 120 goats, and really to be a sustainable goat dairy, we'd have to have about 500 let's say, to 800 goats, and I really wanted to stay on the small side. So, Do you mean if you were just going to sell the milk? Just selling milk, okay. yeah. And so three years ago, we met over an exchange of goats, um, this lovely couple who were, they had a little cheese company called Pug's Leap um, up in Healdsburg, and they um, said, you know, we, we're moving to Australia. Uh, we want to sell our company. And we said, you know, okay. And we thought about it for a couple months. And... Um, realized it was a good opportunity to learn how to make cheese and um, sort of jumped right in. There was literally a month that I spent with the cheesemaker and then he left me in Healdsburg. And so I was renting a creamery in Healdsburg. I was driving my Subaru with milk cans every other day. Um, so basically driving an hour every day um, up to this creamery. And, um, and then in the midst of that, I took a break to take the bar and... <laughs> Then they came back early, like the two days after the bar ended. Oh, we're back early. We're starting time to make cheese. So I really didn't get a break and, you know, got right back in. So then we decided to build a creamery on our own property where the goat dairy is. And we finished that two years ago. And so now we milk and then the milk literally gets gravity flowed through a pipeline down to our creamery. So it's very gently um, handled. And then we've really been up in production the past year. So... It's been quite a journey. <laughs> and so yeah. you two both, your uh, your cheese companies are both farmstead mm -hmm. creameries. Um, Vivi, maybe can you talk about how many of the cheesemakers do you know? I don't, not yes. a number. You don't need a number. Oh, you have a I number. Have numbers. <laughs> I, I, did, I did this before I came. <laughs> yeah, I was I curious I how many that. of the cheesemakers are around what, yeah, are using milk from their own herds. Actually, it's about 70%. Yeah, it's Pretty quite high. a few. I mean, in this area, anyway, it's not. Really? I, I might be wrong. No, that's, okay. that's what it was. I have. I didn't actually look today. I was actually looking to see what was cow, what was goat, what was sheep, <laughs> and how many were open and how many there and, are. And um, Anna and Jill both 
touched on this, but can you just give us a little more sense of why it's so important for a dairy to make its own products? The price of milk, the conventional price of milk in um, is is set somewhere else and has nothing to do with the cost of producing the milk. So a farmer is completely out of control about what they're gonna get paid for the milk that they produce. And it goes up and down every two months and often it is lower than what the actual cost of production is. So when you can make cheese, you actually can you can actually uh, sell your product for more money and you can actually make a living, um, hopefully, if you sell enough cheese. <laughs> right, right. Um, so when it, I'm sure everyone wants to know more about your actual cheeses, speaking of cheeses. And so I know that when you, d you your family decided to start making cheese, you thought a lot about what that product was going to be. Why did you decide to make a blue cheese as your first cheese? Because we were crazy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, so my sisters and I, uh, one of the part of the story I didn't explain was that we all had business careers. So we had been out um, doing various things. I had a sister in finance. I was in marketing and advertising and a sister in sales and a sister in culinary. So again, that was my mom's master plan at work. <laughs> All these skill sets that could come together. But none of us were cheese makers. Uh, none of us had a food science background. None of us uh, knew microbiology. And so when we decided to come together to start the company, um, which this was in uh, early 98, uh, we launched the company in 2000 <clears throat> with our first vats of Original Blue. But you know, part of writing the business plan, um, because we were, you know, taking a very, you know, strategic, you know, you know, business oriented approach to this, you know, how can we start this company so that we can go national within a year and, you know, build a brand that we can then build upon other uh, farmstead products, um, you know, kind of underneath the umbrella. And uh, anyway, we thought, well, we have to, to find a marketing niche, you know, an area that's been untapped. And um, in all of our research, which was, you know, to other cheese makers and food writers and distributors and chefs and retailers, it was almost unanimous back then. So again, early 98, that there was such a shortage of high quality handcrafted blue cheese being made in the country at the time. Um, really there was Maytag uh, Dairy Farms in, in Newton, Iowa, um, which was no longer Farmstead, it had been, but they'd been making cheese for 40 years at the time and, and were really the preeminent brand for blue. Um, and there was uh, a little bit of blue in, coming out of Oregon and a little bit of blue coming out of Massachusetts. But other than that, it was all commercial, commercially manufactured um, great, uh, blue cheese in this country. And then the, the main competition was going to be the imported cheeses. Well, at the same time, there were new tariffs being placed on both Italian and French imports. So we thought, okay, there's a marketing advantage. Um, you know, we'd be the only farmstead blue. We'd be the only blue being made in California. You know, all these things led to why um, we thought it was a good business decision. Um, from a marketing standpoint, we thought, you know, it's not a cheese. We have to educate people on, you know, what the cheese is before they, we can get them to taste it. They, can, they would immediately, you know, have a... Um, you know, an understanding of, of the type of cheese, of the variety. And then as cooks, we thought this was, it's a great cheese to have fun with in the kitchen. And we all had, you know, a culinary interest and one sister had a culinary background. So we thought this, this fits the bill all the way around. So we started building the plant, sourcing equipment, you know, looking at recipes and, and kind of trying to figure out how we were going to do this. Because at the time we were crazy enough to think that we were going to be the cheese makers ourselves. Um, on top of, you know, starting the business, we were going to also be in the plant, um, not milking the cows, but definitely transforming it. Um, we got pretty far down the process and realized, oh, there's a reason there's so little blue cheese in the country. <laughs> Because it's one of the most difficult cheeses to make because the blue mold itself, the Penicillium roqueforti, the bacteria, is airborne inside of your facility. And so it's very limiting. It's difficult to make non-blue varietals in a blue cheese plant. Number one. Number two, it's an aged cheese. So we were going to be locking up our initial investment in inventory for five to six months, not even knowing if we had, you know, a quality product worth, you know, with, whether it was going to be good for the pigs or good for us to eat and sell. And so we were very nervous as we got closer to that first, you know, production date. And uh, about two months before we were ready to make the first vat of cheese, we said, forget it, stop, put the brakes on. And we, we went on a nation nationwide search to find an experienced cheesemaker, which because there's very few blue cheesemakers in the country, there's very few 
people that can run a blue cheese plant in this country. We were fortunate enough to find one who was looking for a job, and, and he helped launch um, the, the product line with us and for nine years built the company on just that one cheese. And were you able to get it out when you had hoped, and did you get it out We did. We, I think we threw away lots one and two, um, <laughs> but everything else has been sellable. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And we're still, we're still uh, you know, refining the process. So that's one of the things about artisan cheese. I'm sure you guys agree. It, I mean, it's just it's an evolving you know, process. You're constantly refining your recipe and changing your systems and making your plant more efficient. And um, therefore, it's, it's really kind of a living um, uh, product that you know you want to celebrate the range of flavor and the range of tastes that you can offer consumers throughout the year. Um, but it's never you, you can never sit on your laurels and, and just say, okay, we got it, let's move on. And your your second cheese was the Toma, right? Which is complete opposite spectrum, Correct. very buttery. Yeah. And After, how, do you, how does that work? In the cheese making process, to well, so our first cheesemaker was with us for the first um, nine years, and then he retired. And when we were replacing him uh, with again with another nationwide search, at that point, my sisters and I understood um, the art and science of cheese making enough to know that with very very careful attention to detail and sanitation in the plant, and separation of products in curing and aging rooms, we could make non blue cheeses in our blue you know, predominantly blue cheese plant. We just had to find the right cheese maker um, that would bring to us, a, you know, a real sound and safe R&D program. And uh, we found that uh, in our, our current um, uh, head cheese maker. His name is Kuba Hemmerling. I, I give him props wherever I can. He's fantastic. And uh, he'd actually never made blue cheese before. So we taught him um, the original recipe. And then we started working on um, uh, the second big, product launch, which we knew needed to be a cheese um, that would not um, pigeonhole us as a blue cheese company. So we wanted a cheese that would cater to all palates, that would be great for cooking, great for snacking, a uh, great melter, you know, and one that would reflect the flavors of the farm. And so Toma is a Dutch style cheese. Um, it presents very much like a very traditional Havarti or a very young Gouda. It's got a lot of um, butter flavor up front, and then the finish has a, um, a tangy, acidic finish um, in the back of your throat that really represents the grass that the cows eat. So we often refer to it as a real terroir cheese. So uh, every year the California Artisan Cheese Festival happens in Petaluma. It's in March, March right? And I got to go on a food a cheese tour during the recent one, which I recommend highly if anyone... Has anyone here been on that? It's, it's a really fun... Yeah. And uh, I got to visit... Um, White Whale Farm, and I remember you telling us about how you learned how to make pug's leaf cheese in the, their cheeses in their facility, and then when you brought your creamery to your farm, suddenly it wasn't quite the same, right? It's yes. what what were some of the issues that happened? Some well, of the things that happened. Um, it was interesting because we were using the same milk and the same recipe, and it was me making it, and we brought it to a new facility, and it was totally different. And um, I think part of it was when I was driving to Hillsburg in milk cans, I really think that part of it was that the milk was sort of jostling all the way to Hillsburg, and it did good things at the time. I don't know, you know. And so we brought it back, and it was just sort of a different milk. It was coming from straight from the milk tank, right after milking, um, super fresh, right to our cheese vat, which is a good thing, but it just changed the, um, the um, outcome. And so, and then the climate's totally different. Healdsburg got hot; it was a little drier. Um, we are almost to Bodega Bay, like Valley Ford area, so it's foggy. And we built our creamery in an old barn, and so we sort of had to tweak the recipe, which took a while, um, about a year actually, to sort of we finally got it back. Which cheese was that? that so this was the original Pug's Leap. Um, they're little bloomy rind, very delicate. I call them diva cheeses because they need to be you know, flipped and turned every day, and um, which was hard when I was living an hour away. And so we, we were making them, and finally got the recipe together, and then they all turned blue, which we didn't, we weren't making a blue cheese, but <laughs> they all turned blue. So um, they tasted good, but it wasn't what we were going for, and so we're now, we took a break from those cheeses, and we started making chev, which I'd never made before, never in my kitchen, I just, and I made it, um, one day, and so that became sort of our staple right now. 
to go to restaurants and stores. Um, it's a very super fresh product. I mean, we milk on Monday, pasteurize Tuesday, and it's to the store on Thursdays and to the restaurants. And so, we're going to taste that tonight, too. So unfortunately, oh. <laughs> um, we had a technical difficulty on Monday, and the batch of chev that was due to come here did not come out. Um, not because of the cheese, because of the vat, which has now been fixed. But um, So today, we actually have our brand new, um, it's a tome style uh, goat milk raw. It's two um, two months, and it's, this is the second time it's been out anywhere. So it's our brand new cheese. It's called Samson after our giant dog that lives on our property and guards our goats. He's about 200 pounds, like a lean 200 pounds. He's huge. No one believes me until they see him. But um, so right now um, we're having the Chev and the Samson, and we're going to be bringing back the French style cheeses in about two months after we get a new. Um, air system to help uh, take the blue away. So it's been a process. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to hear more about the challenges of balancing the needs of the dairy farm, and which is a very dirty place. And then you've got this very pristine cheese making facility on the, all on the same property. Um, just they seem like very different worlds and, and have a lot of different needs. I know you have. Um, you have a pretty big staff at this point, right? Managing that, but how, I don't know how, how. As your family, I mean, I guess you or your family was originally more focused on the dairy production, and then they moved into the cheese as well. Yeah, it how was. Did they do that? It was a lot of um, kind of mindful adjustment for my father, <laughs> um, because he had been, you know, focused on producing the best quality fluid milk possible, and you know, getting it to the milk truck, you know, getting into the milk tank, and then the milk truck would pick it up every morning, and. That was his life's work. Um, and while it certainly, um, you know, he had to pay attention to, you know, with the, the cow care and the ho cow health and nutrition and feed and, and through that, you know, sanitation in the milking barn, you know, once the milk entered the tank, you know, his job was done. Um, and starting a cheese, I mean, uh, a cheese... Um, Production facility, I mean, you quickly realize that it's probably about 75% sanitation. Mm -hmm. um, the art, that's the science of cheese making. You know, the art and craftsmanship that's involved is, you know, when you actually have your hands in the curds and, and you know, you're putting the milk and your, whatever your ingredients, you know, your enzymes and your salt. And um, for us, the blue mold bacteria, you know, you're adding all that in. And then the, then the real craftsmanship, the skill comes in the, the curing and the aging phases and you know the the care the affinage that you have to put into each and every wheel that you produce um, but consistent throughout the different phases no matter what cheese it is that you're making that attention to sanitation and detail is so paramount and more so than ever right now um, for raw milk cheese makers um, because the FDA currently has a, a rule and, and it's been in place for many years that you know it's okay to make and produce and sell raw milk cheeses in this country as long as they go to market um, after 60 days. Um, we're not sure how much longer that requirement is going to stay in place. Um, there's been a lot of uh, concern and new regulations and forums and you know formal conversations and back office conversations both with invited parties a lot of who, who trade organizations that I'm involved in and these guys are aware of um, that um, could be changing these regulations so really we need all of you out there to you know write letters and sign uh, there's a, an organization called the cheese of choice coalition where they're fighting to keep raw milk cheeses alive mm -hmm. in this country um, because it doesn't just affect the cheeses these rules don't just affect the cheeses that are made here in the u.s but also che raw milk cheeses that are imported um, from overseas and i know probably all of you would you know wouldn't want to see your parmigiano reggiano go away <laughs> so or called, your Point Reyes Original Blue. It's called Cheese of Choice. The Cheese of Choice Coalition. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. Um, so and anyway, but it comes down to sanitation, and and on a farmstead operation, you just have all of the more you know um, constraints and variables to to keep a, your eye on you know at all times because you have the animals, you have um, you know water issues, you have drainage issues, you have you know your way disposal, and of course, yes, you have the number one byproduct, which is your manure. And, <laughs> and you have only cows, yes, but we are only how cows. many? How many do you have? We milk about close to 400. And are they all used in your own 
Jesus. We still sell about 10% or okay. so of okay. our um, fluid milk production, and that goes to Clover. Go okay. Clover. <laughs> How about you? You have goats, right? Yeah. And any other... Animals that you um, no, just goats. Right. Yeah. And it's goats. how many right now do you have? A hundred and twenty we're milking. Uh -huh. Um and then we have probably about forty kids and twenty yearlings or so. But for us the farmstead cheese thing was a big adjustment because it was just me and, you know, a little bit of help. Um, like let's say two other people. And so when I first started making cheese, I'm used to being in the barn and I'd be making cheese but then hear that a goat was kidding and having kids, sorry, or having babies out in the barn. So I'd have to literally change all my clothes and go out to the barn and change all my clothes again and go back to the creamery and back and forth and back and forth because, um, you know, you're sort of... And so it was too much. So I finally um, found an amazing herd manager who came in and helped on the dairy side. And he was only 24 when he came, but he had goats since he was eight. And he really started... He was great with the genetics and really improved our milk production, genetics, and quality of our goats. We have super help, healthy goats. Um, and so I could focus on the cheese side, which ironically, my love is the animals. So I'm still sort of, I'm on the cheese side. And I love cheese, but my passion's still in the barn. And so I'm constantly sort of balancing those two. And you also have cheese maker. Yes, that you so I finally, well. I realized my passion in life was not to make cheese. And I felt really guilty about that for a long time. Um, but my passion's always been animals. And so I finally found this amazing woman who, um, uh, who's come in and helped me develop the recipes. And, and um, it's her passion in life to make cheese. And so it's a perfect match. Mm. And it's much better. So I'm now, I help. I'm sort of the backup for everyone. So I'm a backup milker. I'm a backup cheese maker. I'm a backup. I do, you know, the sales, marketing, running the whole farm. So I'm sort of all over the place. Okay. Yeah. So... I don't know if I mentioned the Sonoma Marin Cheese Trail when I introduced you. Sorry, Vivian. But Vivian created, as many of you have the map, I think might have picked up a map outside. Um, and you created that. What? How long ago did you create that? It was in uh, 2011. I believe okay. in 2010. I was on, I'm was. i on the Marin Economic Forum, the board, as the agricultural rep, and it's Economic Commission of, of, of Marin County. And uh, someone, I was looking for a project, and someone suggested that we do the, uh, the the cheese map. And so we had all the cheesemakers came over. I invited everybody and nonprofits and everybody in 2010, in December, and then March of 2011, we released the first map, and it's been through five printings. And, and you have the app too, right? And we which now have an app, really which handy. is all of California. Uh -huh. So if you like visiting cheesemakers, and you want to know about specific events, sometimes just something pops up. It's on this Cheese Trail app, which is on Google Play and Apple, and it's all free. And um, it's yeah. so is the map. And I love how you, uh, you know, it's really easy to tell what kind of milk is at each cream at each cheese facility. Um, how common is it for? cheesemakers to work with different types of milk in in the region or it's do they funny. tend to they, focus there's a lot you know i was looking i was gonna i came here and i thought oh i better like say how many goat how many sheep how many cow dairies and uh, cheesemakers are and i realized a lot of people are crossing over and doing several milks or if they don't actually have like goats and sheep on their farm they're actually buying milk from somebody at cow milk or somebody or something else so people are mixing milks they're making cheeses with different types there's also water buffalo just in case you didn't know that and um, people are all sort of sharing their, their milk. It's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Creating. And then there's the different breeds that people are working with. Yes. How predominant are, is the Jersey cow versus? I think that the... people love Jersey for, um, for their, because it has a higher butter fat content, which is great for cheese making. Um, Holsteins are the most prolific dairy animal in the, in the United States. And um, they also make great cheese, but I think people, some, a lot of the cheesemakers sort of would prefer to have Jersey, but look at the wonderful cheese that comes from Point Reyes Farmstead, and that's Holstein. So it's, it, it makes great cheese no matter what. Mm -hmm. It's just people have preferences, different cheeses. And then in your experience with all the different um, creameries, how many people are, is it, is what they're describing pretty standard or do some people tend to focus more on making the cheese and they you know it, it maybe depends on how large the cheese how, how large the company is you mean their in sanitation terms of their role i'm sorry m more about their role in the i think everybody's the doing different things i think it's kind of interesting i think you're going to find a different story from every cheesemaker some are 
you know, making the cheese is their passion. Some, the animals are their passion. Some, they love doing both. And they all, I think when you're a cheesemaker, most of the small cheesemakers in this region have to do everything. So you really have to multitask. You have to be a bookkeeper. You have to source feed. You have to be a farmer. You have to take care of the animal's health. You have to keep your, your, your plant and creamery up to code. You have to make cheese. You just have so many. And you're a manager. It's a pretty big, it's a really big deal. So if, if people decided to go um, check out some of these creameries on the cheese map, what would they get to see? In well, there's there are two, on the Sonoma Marin Cheese Trail map, there are two driving tours. So if you don't have time and you haven't planned ahead, you can take a Marin um, tour, which is just stopping by various cheesemakers. Some of them are retail. Most of them are retail, actually. There's only a couple that are farms. Um, uh, and you can actually just go buy cheese and maybe see the, the equipment through the window. And often you meet the cheesemakers at the counter. You may not know it, but you're meeting them. <laughs> and um, the other option, if you, if you plan ahead, you can do things like see White Whale Farm. And you just have to, they will have uh, ways to get on there. You just have to look at the map and says the one tours by appointment. And you um, will get a tour and see the animals. You will see their creamery. You will get the story right from the person who's actually making the um, the cheese. And it's it's like hearing their stories. It's it's really kind of interesting. I mean, if you've never been on a farm, it's like amazing. I mean, really. Now that I I've grown up and realize I love farms. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jill, you have your family has. It's called the Fork, right? It's yeah, a visitor. We, we okay. opened the Fork in 2010, and it was really in response to that for the first. Um, uh, well, we started building it in 2009. So for the first nine years, we um, would say yes when trade customers would call us um, and wanting to come on the farm to give them a tour, and then we would end with a tasting at my mother's kitchen table, which was <laughs> charming to a point, you know. <laughs> but it got a little old after nine years, and um, we we had to say no every time consumers would call asking to come to the farm because we just didn't have a place to facilitate um, educational experiences for them. So we thought, you know, looking at what was happening in the wine country and, you know, all the success people have had with, you know, educational venues and culinary centers and tasting rooms, we thought, you know, we can do this for cheese on a dairy. And so we built the Fork, um, which we call, call a culinary and educational center. And uh, we offer um, both trade education and consumer education. And on the consumer side, we uh, have a public calendar that's on our website um, where you can go and see uh, what type of either cooking classes, farm tours, tasting evaluations, um, sensory classes, uh, farm dinners, farm brunches, all those things are listed and they're by reservation only. Um, we release the calendar once a quarter for the following quarter. Um, and then they're quite popular. We have a wonderful executive chef who runs the kitchen. Um, and then we also uh, offer um, the space for private um, educational experiences as well. So we do a lot. We work with a lot of corporate groups and um, private parties and families and so forth so that they can bring um, large parties to the farm and we'll really customize the educational experience for them. <coughs> the whole connection, though, for us is, is really explaining and showing and, and having the guests meet you know, the staff and the animals so that they, they truly understand what farm to table means. It's not just a marketing concept. It's not just a gimmick that you hear about or see at the farmer's market, but that there are family stories and there are people um, and there is an environmental cause and land stewardship that all ties into making the product that you buy at the farmer's market. Anna, you're going to start. You are about to start tours as well, right? Yes. And I know that's a lot of coordination, but mm -hmm. yeah, can you... Talk a little bit about why it's so important to have people yeah. come. Um, for us, I mean, we have, it's just so important because people taste the cheese and then one of the biggest questions, like I get calls every other day, emails, requests to come see the farm and um, we just weren't ready for a long time and now we're finally ready and every time I've done a tour, it just changes the whole experience of people tasting that cheese ever after that because they know the story behind it, they meet the goats, they see the dairy, um, especially for kids. I feel like that's a thing that's really important to me and is some kids have never been to a farm. They didn't, you know, they haven't seen, you know, a goat be milked or, and the, to see that that is made into cheese right over there. And it's just been, um, we kept doing it for trade, sort of for people that we sell cheese to and, and for 4-H um, kids groups. And so finally um, in June, um, 
which will be on our website, which is almost up. We have a splash page. <laughs> it's been almost up for a really long time, but um, in about a month it should actually be up and have our tour dates. And it'll be by appointment, but um, but I um, like the second and fourth uh, Saturday of the month, I think it'll be. So it'll be up on our thing so people can know when it's happening and sign up, and, and I'll be doing the tours. So, yeah. So one of the issues that faces the region is the cost of land, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of Marin Agricultural Land Trust, who's here today. Um, you worked with them, right, to open, can you talk about that? You opened sure. the fork. Yeah, we actually sold our development easement rights um, back in 2007, 2007, 2008. Um, and that, you know, MALT is a wonderful, I don't know if the group here yeah, knows. Yeah, we should probably explain. Knows, the Marin Agricultural yeah. Land Trust was actually founded by um, Vivian's mom um, and uh, Phyllis Faber um, back in what year? 1980. Why don't you talk about what it is? Because you're more into, yeah. close to it, and then I can talk about what it does for so what it the does, farms. What, yeah, that'd be great. So what it does is basically it's a nonprofit, and it buys the rights of the farmers to uh, the right of the uh, of the land. Boy, I'm not doing this well. <laughs> it, 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 the farmer promises to stay in agriculture. They get a chunk of money that is the difference between what the land is valued as development, if it could be developed, or whether it's agricultural. And at the moment, agricultural value, for some odd reason, is very low. Development value is high. So you get a chunk of cash. You agree to stay in agriculture. And that way, your property taxes stay lower. And um, you can, you can uh, whether it, it's sold or it's divided up, you can't, usually can't be divided, but it gets inherited by the next generation. It stays in agriculture and... Um, you are able to um, value it at a... Um, boy, I'm not making this very clear. Okay. Go, keep going. That's okay. <laughs> so the reason why it's very good for the community is it preserves the land as open space in forever, in perpetuity. So no matter if the um, ownership changes hands, it, um, uh, it will stay in agriculture. Um, so obviously the, the value of the land um, is, is uh, decreased quite a bit. Um, because if, I was, if we were to sell our farm, we, we could not sell it um, to a developer uh, for any type of non-agricultural use. Um, but the reason that it's good for the families, the multi-generational families that have been on, on these farms for years is that A, it can help pay for inheritance taxes. Um, B, um, there are many scenarios where, you know, as a farm is passed down, you know, from one primary landowner, you know, the parents to the children, um, there could be four kids and only one wants to stay in the farm, but how can they buy out their siblings? So um, selling their, their malt um, uh, easements uh, uh, can help pay for that. Um, and then third, um, which is the reason that we sold our um, development easement rights um, several years ago, was so that we could in reinvest in our business. So we'd been making cheese. Um, we thought about um, it was time to, to build a new um, uh, large storage and, and office facility on the farm. And then that also turned into the, um, the home of the Fork, um, our, our culinary center. But in order to afford that capital investment, we said, OK, it's the it, now is the time to sell um, our easement rights to malt. And so it really helped launch our company and diversify it yet again from you know the core business being fluid milk on a dairy secondary business being selling artisan cheese, and now our, our third business, which is agritourism. I want to just add one more thing, is, which is that it also lowers the property value so that it, when the next generation inherits it, you do not lose it to inheritance taxes. Because if the value is lower, you're able to, 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 it, it is able to stay in agriculture. Otherwise, we'd all have to sell when our parents die. And what do you, can you talk about what, your mo what was going on at the time when your mother decided to be part of this movement to I think, create you know, the organization? You know, dare I say it, you know, you flee Hitler and you say, okay, I'm not going to, my mother was, I am not going to be kicked out of one more place I love in my life. And I love this place. I love farming. We will make it work. And all of us, I think we were all struggling. Farming is not a lucrative business by any means. And I think most of the dairies, even though nobody will tell each other this, have been struggling for years. And so it was really something that helped um, the farms to continue. And that was really the point, was to help all of us as a group um, stay in agriculture. 
you ha- have you worked with malt? No, malt? I'm in Sonoma. Partly, oh, right. And yeah. I've looked into it on the Sonoma version. Um, we have a small property and it's the surrounding land is owned by one family. So I would have to get the surrounding family on board with me to have enough land to have it be worth it. So we're sort of trying, but they're not quite on board. So they would have to we'll give see. up their yes their yeah. their rights. As not well. that they're against it, they're just not quite on board yet. Right, so right, right. we'll see. Yeah. And so the one of the things you're competing with the dairy farmers in the area are competing with are the larger farms in the Central Valley, of course, that have a lot they have a lot less land per animal, I understand. Mm-hmm. I think it's something like in Marin, Sonoma, it's something like one cow per acre, which is pretty large, which is a lot of land. Mm-hmm. So um, maybe it, I think when people go to a store and they see Bellwether Farms, or that's another local cheese company, they see the ricotta is, you know, $9, and then the one, the, the other one is 2 or th- 3 or $4. Maybe you could talk about what goes, what, why are those prices, obviously you're making artisan products, so I think people understand that, but here it is, it's a local product. Why does it cost so much more than, you know, the Italian one that's imported? There's so many factors that go into that uh, artisan product. Can you talk about some of them that you're start. facing? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, partly is the land cost. Um, the feed costs are just so high. And goats, as opposed to cows, are not great grazers. They, um, they're not, so a cow will eat grass all the way down to pretty, you know, very efficiently. Goats will eat eh, here, and then they'll go over here, and they prefer to browse. And so where cows can be managed more to graze the land that's there, um, goats, I have to buy alfalfa just to, for mil- the milkers, which is just, the price has gone up, I think, three times as high as when I started in 2008. Um, and is that so part partly related to the drought? Partly, but um, it's it's a lot of different factors. I think where the hay was coming from, there's hay being shipped. Um, I don't know if you probably could talk about this more, but to other countries, and so there's sort of shortages in hay, and um, it's just a lot of different factors. So there's the hay, and um, yeah, just cost. I mean, it's cost of living, cost of all the, you know, employing people. Just everything's really high in this area, and. Some milk, and our, our cost of milk, because we have a really small dairy, is really high. So there's other companies who could buy milk for, like from the Central Valley, they have lower costs. They could have a 1,000 goats, so their cost is lower, and you can buy milk um, at a lower cost. But I'm choosing to have a small farm, and I can, I have really good quality milk. I know all my goats, but my cost of production is a lot higher than a big, big dairy. So that's why. My cheese is more. And there's also <laughs> issues around just getting your cheese in the stores, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. the <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. I mean, everything that Anna said is 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 very accurate. You know, the cost of feed, the cost of transport for of the feed. You know, we're, we're not, we don't live in an area that is. Um, you know, like the Central Valley where feed is right, you know, is growing on the farm next door or that you can have extra acreage to grow your own feed. Um, We do graze half of the year, but because of our Northern California climate, you know, um, the the pastures dry up and and there there isn't a nutritional value once the fields Mm -hmm. turned golden. Um, And so we're buying more feed half of the year. Um, And one of the big things is cost of labor. You know, it's just, it's skyrocketed. Um, It is so difficult to find good labor um, that was willing to come, especially to the rural parts of Marin and Sonoma. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, and just to find really good, loyal employees um, is is very difficult and very challenging for all of the cheesemakers. So you end up having to kind of lure folks by having either on-farm housing or um, provide housing subsidies. pay for their fuel, uh, we have a carpool incentive program, we, we give staff meals to our, um, uh, our crew when they're um, working shifts. Um, I mean, it's, you know, all these because things to have, incentivize they're having them. a hard time finding mm-hmm. housing, too. Mm-hmm. And, okay. mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and sorry to interrupt, but also with the feed, the grazing, so can you talk about the drought and how that's affected what's available for the animals? Yeah, well, the cost of feed um, is going up tremendously and is projected to um, more than double by the end of um, the summer because of that. Um, 
we actually are, are doing okay. Um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, um, but it takes a lot of advanced planning and land conservation uh, um, for years in order to set yourself up, uh, you know, saving for the rainy day. And we've done that through um, uh, above ground storage ponds um, that we have continued to add to. Um, so that we have good water storage for our animal and our um, our animal water, as well as our um, little bit of irrigation that we will do from now through um, probably the end of June. Um, and we have many um, spring wells that we tap into for uh, human consumption and all the sanitation on the farm. Um, and we've also employed some sustainable methods where we can recycle and reuse water um, for additional like dairy, like the barn sanitation and so forth. And um, we'll reuse water that's um, used to heat the milk. Um, we'll reuse that uh, for sanitation in the cheese plant. So a lot of just different methods and thinking out of the box to, to use as little water as possible and conserve everything that comes from the sky um, year round and for years so that um, when we do have the drought periods, we're able to satisfy um, what we need um, and keep our fingers crossed. So we're, we can pretty much find your cheeses. It's not too hard to find, especially the original blue, right? And what about the other cheeses? Where um, well, here locally, you can find our cheese, you know, at all of the specialty cheese shops. Um, cheese Plus on Russian Hill is celebrating their 10th anniversary on Saturday. I hope everybody will come. It's going to be a huge party. A lot of the cheesemakers are going to be there. So I'm just going to give a little shout out to, to Ray Bear, the owner there. Um, but uh, all of the specialty cheese shops um, carry our, our line of cheeses, including our fresh mozzarella and our Bay Blue, our newest blue cheese, and then our brand new Cornelia. Um, and uh, Farmer's Market. We're at the San Francisco Ferry Plaza every Saturday if you want to come meet our staff. Um, also, Oakland Grand Lake on Saturdays and Marin Civic Center on Sundays. What's the Cornelia like? I haven't heard about that one yet. Cornelia is a brand new product that we're just kind of spotting out there and just getting people's, people excited about it. But it's a joint venture between ourselves and Murray's Cheese Caves out of New York. So we make a small baby Toma in a one pound format. And then we send it to Murray's right after it's made and then they um, wash it with bee linen bacteria. So it's a, it's a washed rind version of Toma until it gets, it ages from the outside in and it's kind of like full of umami and some peanut butter flavors and this, but it's got the, the original flavor of the butter notes of Toma coming through and it's really soft and it's delicious. Anyway, Murray sells half of them on the East Coast. They sell half of the inventory back to us, and we sell it um, here on the West Coast. So it's really fun. It's a new, a fun new thing. Like you were saying, you know, some yeah. some cheesemakers play with mixed milks, and we're playing with a a cave in Greenwich Village, New York. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and how about where can we? I know your cheeses are available around, especially around Petaluma area, right? Can you talk about where else people can find them right now? Um, we just started having our Fresh Chev and Rainbow Grocery, um, and which is very exciting, <laughs> and um, other avenues, which is way out, sort of near Judah. And um, we're going to start expanding the San Francisco because this is where I'm from. Like, it just took a little bit to. My mother still lives in the city, and we literally had like cheese drop offs in Marin. Like, here's the cheese, and she drop it off, you know. So we're still working on our. That's our delivery system right now. <laughs> um, so at the moment, um, it's me delivering cheese in Petaluma, Sebastopol, uh, a little bit Santa Rosa. We have in Napa. It's at the Oxbow Market, um, which is another cheese handoff to someone else that gets to Napa. So we'll be coming, and again on our website, we're gonna have a map with um, all the places you can find our cheese. And, and what's how do you convince somebody to sell your cheese? How does that work? <laughs> um, usually, when it all goes well, we just bring the cheese and they try it and they really like it. And um, it depends on the store, um, you know, depending on what they're carrying. Like Rainbow for a long time had a different chev, and then that chev they don't have anymore as of like three weeks ago. So. He called me and said, okay, fine, we can take your chef. So um, it takes a little, you know, each store is different. And uh, we do a lot of restaurants in Petaluma and Sebastopol, too. So, um, and we are just started with a distributor. Um, so that it's going to more places than I know of, uh, mostly restaurants, I think, in sort of Palo Alto and down there. So I just want to say, you, I encourage you guys to ask at your cheese store to what's local and then try, all, try them all, because they're all so different and so much fun. Yeah. 
And yeah, I wanted to ask you, Vivian, why do you think this area is producing so many amazing cheeses? Do you have any well, idea? We're the only part of California that still has small farms, which is really great. And um, so that's one part of it. So, and we all have, we have pasture that we can grow in and it's just, and we have an agricultural community and a, and a system here and an infrastructure that supports that. And the great thing is all these, we have all these innovative people that just come back and start doing interesting things. Like, you know, come on. It's, it's, we've got the best of the best here. Well, and how, how important is it to be located near such a food mecca, you know? <laughs> oh, it's been, it, it's been pivotal for, you know, our success, to our success. Um, you know, when uh, getting started 15 years ago, you know, we had to, to remind ourselves that not every consumer was like the consumer that lives in the Bay Area. That, you know, where the, the eating local and farm fresh and um, knowing your farmers and wanting to visit your farms is, is commonplace. I mean, that we, we live in a little bit of a bubble. Not so much anymore, I think, as food consciousness has really been raised across the country um, in the last... Um, several years, but certainly 15 years ago, I mean, we kind of felt like we're preaching to the choir here. You know, everybody in the Bay Area loves good food and loves to, to pay for good food. Um, so how do we educate, you know, consumers in Los Angeles, for example, that, you know, maybe don't really care or don't know the, the value of, of spending that extra dollar, um, but it's gotten a lot easier. Um, since we've been in the business. Is, is your business mostly here? I mean, how, how much of your business is national versus local? Well, we, we went national right from the beginning as, as part of our business plan. Um, but still, 15 years later, we sell about 60% of our total product here on the West Coast. Okay. Can I add one thing? Mm -hmm. Another big thing we've done is to have stores we sell to or restaurants bring all their staff out to the farm and that made a huge difference. And they had a great time. And then they go back to their store, their restaurant, and they know our story, and they care about the cheese, and they know why the cost is what it is. And it's been fun, and it's made a huge difference in like, getting our cheese out there. So yeah. I think we're all right. Oh, Time for questions? OK. All right. It looks like we're going to start taking questions from the audience. Should I hand this over? Yes. Okay. We only have four microphones, so. Well, we have more microphones we're using for it. First question. I wanted to just ask Vivian how she defines a small farm. Ooh, you had to ask me that, didn't you? Um, well, I would say, first of all, they have pasture. I, I think that the average farm in, in Sonoma and Marin is of cows, which I know more of than goats or sheep, probably three to 500 cows. And I think that's a small farm. You know, when you're talking about the valley, you're talking 10,000, anywhere from two to 10,000 cows. And so, and they don't have, gro um, it's usually an acre per, per um, animal. So we're talking probably anywhere from probably three to three, 300 to 1,000 acres, I'm guessing, right? But yeah. on the goat side, it's a little smaller. So yeah. we have 80 acres, which is big for, and I milk uh, 100 goats. So we're sort of on the that's true. smaller side. That's small, true. small side. Next question. Oh, next question back here. Oh, stand Thank you. This is not really a question. It's for Vivian and Jill because you're too young. <laughs> <laughs> but you missed part of the story about development rights. All of, we all of West Marin was going to be developed into ranchettes in the 70s. <laughs> we, know. we know that. That was in the, in the 70s. They were going to put a freeway all the way up and down the coast. And uh, Point Reyes was destined to be 50,000 people. And I know that there was a coalition of a lot of individuals. And you should see the movie Rebels, Rebels with a Cause, which tells the story of how um, the Golden Gate National Park and, and, and uh, the Point Reyes National Seashore and the farms were all saved. It's an amazing documentary. It's only an hour long. Right, and, and I was out at the Ponches, and he brought out, Al brought out the original brochure that the Board of Supervisors put out, and from Point Reyes Station to almost um, Fallon Road, it was going to be not only developments, it was going to be shopping centers, and we have the people of West Marin to thank for that not happening. And I do have a question for Vivian. How much of your milk goes into um, your cheeses? Because I know you have not only yourself, but the treshes, and I just saw another ranch the other day. Strauss Family Creamery does not make cheese, just so you know. 
So there are about 10 dairies that give to Strauss Family Creamery. And, that's, and, and the Strauss Dairy is one of them. And the Tresh is another one of them. But there are um, a number of others as well. Great. Next question in the back. I know that we're here uh, for cheese, but I was wondering if you've thought about yogurt ever or what that business is like. Um, for me, um, one of our, so th the first up till six months ago, we were selling to Redwood Hills. Um, and so we were selling all of our milk to Redwood Hills and they have a pretty large yogurt business and they do yogurt, they do kefir, which is actually um, more than their cheese business. And so for us, um, we just, it made more sense to stay on the cheese side and not compete with someone who is similar to us. They're much bigger than us and buy milk from a lot of different companies, but um, we're sticking with cheese. But you never know in the future. Yeah. Same. We're Can't do everything. Yeah. Can't do everything. <laughs> Next question on your right. Hi, this is Rana. Uh, so I love all kinds of cheese, but I particularly like chevre. And um, so I tried making it at home. <laughs> and I was astounded at about how little cheese you get for the amount of milk that it takes <laughs> and how much whey is left over. So I wonder yeah. if you could say, what the heck do you do with all that whey? Uh, and are there ways that maybe home cheese makers can be, get a little more efficiency out of their goat milk? Uh, that's a good question. And um, can you let us know how much whey is like? It really depends on the milk, and it depends what you did. Like, it really changes. We'll have batches that they're like, whoa, like, whoa there's way more whey, way more whey. Um, <laughs> um, because the temperature was higher or something. I mean, like, it changes per batch. Uh, we give it to, we have pigs, and so we give it to our pigs, and then we have a pig farmer uh, close by that comes and picks it up because we have more whey than we can handle. Um, but I understand. Uh, some people um, make ricotta out of whey, but it depends what kind of cheese you're starting with, but um, we have... I have a suggestion. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, um, you could, I've made some, some chev too, and I love cooking whole grains in it, using it as a cooking liquid because it absorbs the flavor of the, of the whey. It's really delicious. And you can make drinks with it as well. That's true. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> Next question in the front. Uh, yes, I was wondering what the uh, pros and cons are of having your cheese... It is in Costco, isn't it? In Novato. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have one. Um, uh, we have a large format of our original blue, so it's a one-pound wedge in Costco. Um, and well, the pro is that we don't sell actually directly to Costco. We sell to a distributor, and we don't tell our distributors who they can and can't sell to. Um, but the pro for us is that it gives people um, an opportunity to buy a large format of our cheese um, for special occasions or parties or groups or what have you um, at a lower cost. And hopefully it introduces them to the product so that then when they want it just for personal or smaller use, they can, you know, they're familiar with the product and they can buy it from a local cheesemonger um, or a specialty store. Um, so it's been good to add to our marketing. Next question over here. This is a question for Tara. I enjoyed your semi-regular cheese column in the San Francisco Chronicle. And at, at, when I got to the last column that I'm aware of that you wrote, you kind of just said, well, folk, this is the last column. That's all, folks. I know you've continued to write for the Chronicle. Was that part of a downsizing effect? Because you know, there's some lack of cheeses out there that didn't get written up. Right. Actually, uh, sorry. the columnist is Janet Fletcher, who's also, yeah, that's OK. She, no, 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 it's OK. Um, and she is also an author who writes a lot of great books on cheese and cooking. And she actually has a new book about yogurt. That's really a wonderful book. And unfortunately, I can't speak to the reason for that. Um, but yeah, the, the whole food section was redesigned, and there's a whole new approach. So I agree there are a lot more cheeses out there that uh, obviously, they're being made all the time. Can I give, can I give Janet a, a plug? She's got a website called Planet Cheese. And she still has a great directory and glossary of all the cheese types and um, terms and um, brands. And she showcases a different uh, new cheese um, every week on her blog, Planet Cheese. Great. Next question over here. Um, how much of a challenge is it for newer cheese makers to get distribution through specialty stores and even in farmer's markets? You know, or if you make a really good product, can you get into the 
you know, retail and, and wholesale distribution channels? <laughs> um, it is a challenge trying to navigate this whole map of all these different, you know, distributors and retail and farmers markets and how much do we go to what. The farmers markets um, are hard because it's, you know, how many cheeses do they already have? If you're a new cheesemaker, um, it's hard to get into some of the bigger markets. Um, on the distributor side, I've actually found the distributors have been really supportive in um, sort of helping us along as a new cheesemaker, and they were more receptive than I thought they'd be to knowing that the cheese is going to change. I was like, oh, I have a new cheese. You know, it's great today and tomorrow and maybe next week, but it might it just be different, you know, in a month. And they were more receptive than I thought to that. So they've been actually really supportive. Um, and stores, again, you know, it's hard as a new cheese. If the Chev was a totally different um, beast than the little lactic French cheeses. And so all these people wanted these little lactic French cheeses, which are the hardest ones to make, which, you know, but the Chev, you know, there's a lot of other chefs out there. So learning how to market a totally different product was a challenge. And so we, that's why we started with a lot of restaurants um, really pushing that it's so fresh. And we just had to say, you know, melt on Monday, pasteurize Tuesday, in stores Thursday, Friday. And that really um, helped a lot. So I, telling more of the stories helped us get through. But um, yeah. So. We have time for one more question. Who has a really good one? No pressure. Anyone? Uh, all right. Well, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Tara maybe to then ask one final question. Well, I forgot to ask Vivian about your performance piece that you're working on because you've done agriculture related <laughs> performance pieces, <laughs> including, <laughs> and we'd all like to see it ne the next time you're on stage. <laughs> well, if you didn't see my show last year, which was E I E I Oi in bed with a farmer's <laughs> daughter, which <laughs> which was how cows influenced my decisions in bad relationships. Um, I am going, I am now working on a storytelling thing, which actually would be, rather than me playing myself and 15 other characters, it's just gonna be me telling my story about growing up on the farm and all those farm and rural stories about what it's like to grow up in West Marin. And I've just started working on that. So watch for it. It's gonna be called Dairy Heiress. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, I'm going to ask you all for a favor, which is we to let these guys get out to their cheese tables before you get to their cheese tables. So I'm going to ask the ushers to kind of keep you all in. Give them like two minutes. It's like when you're on a plane and people have to make a connection. So thank you so much. Make your connection. <laughs>